So listen, we're in a series right now called Ever Wonder Why, and we're asking some really hard questions, some big, uh, tough questions, really. Last week, we talked about, you know, why does God let good things happen to bad people? Uh, That was a great message. I hope that it helped you guys out. And this week, we're just going to jump right into it, but this week is a harder topic. This is something that churches don't often talk about. In fact, when I was talking with John before the service and saying, here's what I'm preaching on this morning, so I don't, I don't remember the last time that we actually you know, spoke about that or, or had, a, had a sermon on that. But by not talking about it, we're really missing out on an opportunity to shed light and truth on something. So we are a loving church. We are a church that accepts everyone that comes through the doors. We are a church that, that is here to inspire everyone to Jesus, no matter where you are in your journey or where you are not in your journey. But we are also a truthful church. And we're also a church that doesn't leave things that are in the Bible out because we want you to know what God's Word says. And so this morning we're going to tackle kind of a, a difficult topic. But We're going to tackle it because we should, and because ultimately it's life-giving for us, and it's going to be good for us to talk about it. So the question that we're going to answer today, or the question that I hope we're going to answer today, is this. Why would a loving God send people to hell? So why would a loving God send people to hell? So this idea of, of talking about hell as a place... And, and if you've got little kids in here, earmuffs, or you can, you'll have to explain it to them. I'm so glad that my three-year-old is not in here because then he'll run around the house just saying that word over and over and over again. But So it's a word I'm going to use a lot this morning, just warning you parents. It's now on you and off of me. But why would a loving God send people to hell? It, hell is, a, is an interesting thing to talk about, and it's something we don't like to talk about because it has negative connotations to it. It's hard to talk about it. But But... Let, let me put it to you this way. Let, let's say hell is a real place. And, and, and let's say that, that, that I'm, I'm the devil or you're the devil and you're, you, you know that hell's a real place. Would, wouldn't it be to your benefit to minimize this? Like, hey, you know what? Church, you don't need to talk about this. You don't need to take this topic seriously. Hey, hey church, you, no, 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 no. Just speak about happy, fun things. No, just talk about the goodness of God and the grace of God and heaven. Just, you need to leave this out. You're going to scare people away. No, 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 no. Don't talk about that. Wouldn't it be such a victory for Satan, for the church, to never talk about this thing? Because if we never talk about this, it's kind of like giving Satan what he wants. You know, I'll tell you another thing. Pe- people would often ask me this question. They would say, man, I'm doubting God. And because I'm doubting God, does that mean there's something wrong with my faith? And I would say, no. That means that I think the Holy Spirit's working in you and moving in you. Because guess what? The last thing that Satan would want you to doubt is God. Because if you doubt God, then you're going to go looking for God or find God. Or you're going to explore it or dig into it. Satan wants to make sure that you are just completely never in doubt. You're never motivated. You don't ever have to worry about this. In fact, minimize it. Don't think about it. But but that's, that's not true. And that's not reality. And so, in fact, the person that talked about hell the most in the Bible was actually the person that was the most loving person in the Bible. And that was Jesus. So Jesus talked about hell a lot. He spoke about it more than anybody else. And I I just think it's so fitting that the person that brought the most love to all of eternity and mankind is also the person that spent the most time talking about this in the Bible. And Jesus didn't use it as a scare tactic. So this is even this message today. Let me get this out up front. I am not scaring you into heaven. It's not my job to do that. And that's not my intention. I'm not trying to scare you out of hell. That wasn't Jesus' intention either. Jesus never spoke about hell to try and scare people into heaven. Jesus, most of the time when he referred to hell, he spoke about it to believers to motivate them and to encourage them to stay strong in their faith and to not, to not bend and, you know, to not kind of take this. Again, it would be the devil's greatest desire for, for you to not worry about that. And so Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples and then the, those that followed him did not take on that mindset. And in fact, I've got a verse that illustrates this for us right here. It's in Matthew, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you. Matthew chapter 
They're putting it on the screen. Give me a three, two, one. There it is. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye, so this, this, is, this is Jesus talking here. If your right eye makes you stumble and leads you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. So if we take this literally, th this could mean, let's say uh, you've got a men's group. We've been talking about the men's camp. If all the men, you know, took this literally, when they would show up at the men's camp, none of them would have eyeballs because they, not, not a single... Not a single one of us would. So if your right eye makes you stumble and leads you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. This is Jesus giving instructions. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. So in brackets there, I always like to explain for our new people. This is the amplified version of the Bible. It uses the New American Standard Bible. I know this is dorky, but I just want you to know that the translation is word for word. And every time you see a little bracket that we use... That, that's, that's expounding on what the word actually means. And so what this means, what Jesus is talking about, is he's not saying to remove your eyes. There's not a booth out here where you can go and just pop them out and get clean. He's saying remove yourself from the source of temptation. Pull yourself all the way out. Now why does he say that? We go on to the next verse in, verse, in the rest of the verse. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So Jesus really wanted to get this thing, get the point across. He's saying, hey, if you're following me, if you're a disciple of me, if you care about the things that I'm teaching you, if you're claiming that you're a Christ follower, you need to take this thing all the way seriously. You need to protect yourself. You need to make sure that you understand that, that it's better for you to, to, to lose a part of your body than for all of you. To go to hell. Now, when Jesus gives us this verse, the word that he uses for hell here, it, it's actually translated from the Greek word Gehenna. And so, when Jesus talked about this in, in Matthew, this was the word that he was using, and this was actually a place. Now, this was a real place, and it was located in the southwest corner of the city of Jerusalem, just outside the wall. Now, this place that Jesus is referring to, he's not referring to the lake of fire and all those things that we think about today. What he's referring to in this verse is, is this place, Gehenna. And it was also known as, as the Valley of Hinnom. It would come to be known that. And what it was is this was a place that they would throw their trash, a place they would throw their garbage. It was the place that people would, would throw the dying. It was a place where they would put the dead bodies. It was a place that, that was just a no-go zone. It was a place that was desolate. And in fact, this place, it still today remains mostly desolate. And I have a picture for you here. This is the valley of Hinnom today. And, and th this area in the middle with no buildings or no development, this is an area that no one wants to build on, no one wants to do anything with. So when Jesus is talking to people and he's telling them, hey, I, I don't want you to go to this place He's, he's talking, he's giving them an example that they really understand. This is the least desirable place that I want to go. That's where, 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 where no help is, where no goodness is. And in fact, if you go back before Jesus' time, there was a king, a guy named King Ahaz. And King Ahaz had, had a god, little g, that he liked to worship. And this god was named Molech. And what King Ahaz would do in worshiping Molech is King Ahaz would actually sacrifice children. And so they would bring children in and burn them in fire. And guess where they did that? They did that in the valley of Hinnom. They did that in the place that, that you just saw the picture of. And so this, this area, this place, it has this reputation. It has this, this understanding amongst the people of being just a horrid, horrible place. In fact, I'll show you where this is in Scripture. In Jeremiah, we actually read the story. So th this is the story of King Ahaz uh, doing the child sacrifices. So they have built the highest, they have built the high places of Topheth, which is the valley of Ben Hinnom, which you saw the picture of, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, to honor Molech, the fire god. Now this place that Jesus is talking about. This becomes the land of no more. So the land of no more is a land of no more hope, a land of no more freedom, a land of no more health, a land of no more opportunity. It's the end of the road. It's the absolute end. See, it, it, it's, it's the place 
that there is nothing to come beyond it. It is literally the land of no more. And so when Jesus is, is bringing up hell to us, He's saying, I don't want you to go to the land of no more. I don't want you to end up in the land of no more hope. I don't want you to end up in, in the land of no more faith or no more happiness or no more joy. I don't want you to end up there. See, if, if heaven in its essence is the presence of God, then, <clears throat> then hell in its essence is the absence of the presence of God. And so then this becomes the land of no more presence of God. See, it's amazing the way that Jesus taught people. Because he taught people theologically. He taught people what he wanted them to understand to penetrate their heart. But Jesus used real, everyday examples of this. He used things that people could understand. And that, that's the point that I hope to get across to you. Is that when Jesus is talking about this place to this crowd of people in Matthew... They, are, they, in their mind, are thinking, this is the place where King Ahaz sacrificed children. This is the place where we take our dead. This is the place where we take dead dogs. This is the place where we take our garbage. This is the land of no more hope, no more opportunity. Jesus is saying, stay out of that place. And see, what Satan would want to tell you is, hey, that, that's not so bad. That's not such a bad place. Don't worry about that place. Don't worry about ending up there. It's all good. It's okay. But... We cannot, as a church, be okay with letting people go to the land of no more. Even here in our city, we have people that live in the land of no more hope. They live on your street. They're your neighbors. We have people that live in the land of no more happiness. We have people that live in the land of, of no more joy. They're sitting in this room. And so we want to set those people free today. We want to introduce something that can help them to come out of the land of no more and into the land of hope and freedom and love and joy and living. But let's talk about hell just a little bit more. So why, why does it exist? Why was it created? God created hell for two reasons. There are two distinct reasons why God made it. And the first reason that God made it is that hell, hell exists so that God can righteously punish Satan. That, that's, that's why it's there. So many of you don't know this, but it's a kind of a fun fact. But did you know that, that Satan was actually one of God's mightiest angels? That at one point in time, Satan was actually kind of known as God's worship leader. And what happened is that Satan actually grabbed a, a, a coup of people, of other angels, and they tried to rebel against God because, see, Satan wanted to be God. He wanted to, to excel above God. He wanted to have a position equal to or greater than him. And now in the book of Isaiah, it actually talks about the moment that Satan took on that mindset, God banished him and threw him out of heaven, and he put him down on earth. So when we talk about in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, Satan, the devil, who's, who's crawling around and who ends up deceiving Adam and Eve to eat the apple, it's, it's the guy that got banished from heaven. That, that's who this is. And so God created hell in order to banish or in order to punish Satan. See, Satan's desire for you is that he wants to come and he wants to kill and steal and destroy. Everything that you have in your life, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. See, we, 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 we don't like... Karina, go to the next slide for us. We, we don't like to think about these words, kill, steal, and destroy. And we don't even like to think of the word Satan. Like it feels weird to hear it. It feels weird to say it. But this is what he wants to do with your life. This is a reality check. I want you guys to, to check into this. I want you to understand this. Parents, if you have kids, guess what Satan wants to do? Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy your kid's future. Guys, if you have a marriage, Satan wants to come and kill and steal and destroy your marriage. If you try and have healthy finances, Satan wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy your finances. If you're trying to live up to a moral standard, if you're dating, you're trying to save yourself for, uh, for marriage before you, know, you, you, you give your virginity to that person, that special person, guess what? Satan wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy your virginity. See, everything that you have in your life that's good, everything that you have that God has for you, Satan wants to come, kill, steal, and destroy it. And in fact... Satan shows us that. The first thing that he does with Adam and Eve is Satan kills, steals, and destroys the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God. From the beginning of time until now, this is, this is his agenda. 
And this is why we have to talk about this, because there's those of you out there, and then there's me, and there's my wife, and there's everyone in this church, and everyone that works here. We have to understand that this guy is not messing around. Satan is not just laying back. He's not, just, he, he's not passive about you. And so even if you're not a, a regular attender here at this church, or if you're not even a Christ follower, I, this isn't to scare you. It, it's like... I grew up in, in East Tennessee, and we have a lot of bears in East Tennessee. And the purpose of a bear is to eat food. And sometimes if a bear gets, gets distracted or he gets confused or he gets sick, he may see you as that food. Now, if I were standing on the side of a trail and you were standing in front of me and a bear was running at you, I, 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 I don't want to yell at you and say, hey, 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 watch out, there's a bear coming because I don't want to scare you. I don't want to startle you. I mean, that could be jarring for you. Now, that doesn't make any sense because then you would get eaten. I would freak out. I'd freak out for you. Try and get you to freak out and get you to run or get you to do. Actually, you're supposed to make yourself big and yell back at the bear. And and then they they veer away. But in the same regard, whether you are a Christ follower or not, I just want you to know that I love you and I care about you and this church loves you and cares about you and we're watching you stand on the trail of life as you walk through life and I'm watching Satan come at you. Come at your children, come at your family, come at your finances, come at your vehicles, come at whatever you've got. He's coming at you. And so I'm not going to sit back and say, ah, you know, I don't want to, you know. No. As a church, we want to freak out and we want to help you understand like, hey, we want you to be safe from this. And so, the person that absolutely embodies evil, this devil or Satan, hell is the perfect place to righteously punish the embodiment of evil. It's the perfect place for that to happen. It makes sense that God would create hell to punish the embodiment of evil. And in fact, I have a verse in Romans to show this to you. In Romans here it says, And the devil... And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They would be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the punishment for him. That, that's how God sees that Satan should, should get. So we don't want to underestimate this guy because God's not underestimating him. Now the second reason that hell was created was because hell exists for God to righteously punish evil. So in the first one, he was righteously punishing the, the embodiment of evil. But now God has to actually punish evil. So we talk about, okay, what is evil? Now this is where things get a little bit muddy in today's society, all right? So evil is those who have sinned and are without Christ. Now sin is something that's kind of hard to talk about because what is a sin and what is not a sin? Well, in, in essence, what a sin means is a sin is missing the mark. All right. So then that takes me to the point of, well, who determines what the mark is? Especially nowadays in our culture, we live in a society and a culture where you can't tell me what's right for me. I decide what's right for me. I decide what I live by. You don't decide what I live by. I get to pick my own code, my own standard. I get to determine what's good for me, and it doesn't matter if it's bad for you. See, we, we live in a society now where everybody is making a decision to say that, that they get to set the own standard, their own standard for their life. And so therefore, this idea of, of a sin missing the mark, it's like, what is the mark? You know, what, what is it? We all have those people in our lives that, that we think, how can they just get away with this or do this? Or how can they be okay with the level of corruption or, or the way that they lie? Or how can they be okay with being so rude or so mean? Well, because they... They're missing the mark, but they've redefined what the mark is. But the, the nice thing to know about the mark is that we don't have to guess what this mark is that God wants us to hit. We, we don't have to guess it at all. Because, see, the holiness of God is what set this mark. So the holiness of God, when, when God created the world and he created the relationship that we have with him and that Adam and Eve had with him, and, and God created, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and then he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, and he gave us very clear instructions to love God and love your neighbor. And see, we have this Bible, we have this set of scriptures that gives us the mark. It gives us what holiness is. 
It tells us what we have to hit in order to not sin. But as all of you know, none of us in here are perfect. We all sin. Has anyone today told a lie? Yeah, raise your hands. Be accountable. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) I don't want to mess anybody's ride home up. But has anyone ever told a lie? Has anyone ever uh, been lustful? Has anyone ever been deceitful? Has anyone ever done, you know, what, there's, we've all sinned. We, we all miss the mark. No one is perfect. And that's kind of the whole point. See, God's holiness sets a standard that absolutely nobody can meet. Now, this may seem unfair, But if God sets a standard that no one can meet, therefore we're all sinners. And if hell exists to punish evil, which evil is the existence of sin, then therefore, guess what? We're all originally predestined, or not predestined, but we're all, as we're born, we're headed towards hell. And that's a hard truth. It is. It's a hard truth. But let me walk you through it one more time. Because then we're going to go to a better place with it. If God set the mark so that holiness is the mark, none of us can live a perfect, holy life. Therefore, we've all sinned. We all have sin in our lives, and we've all missed the mark. And therefore, because we sin, we have evil, and hell is a place to punish evil. Therefore, we are all going to hell at some point. Now, again, even as I say it as your pastor, I want you to know there's a little small voice in me that wants to run behind this curtain over here and hide. Thanks, Gail. I appreciate your laugh. <laughs> it made me feel better. So it is, because even for me, this is, this is tough to talk about. But the truth about it is, is that it's impossible for God to be holy without also being just. It's, I don't want to serve a God that can be holy and not be just. See, see there's this truth about God that, that He cannot compromise for us. See, he, because He is holy, because He set the standard, He also has to be just, which means God has to judge sin. It has to be judged. So all of us in the room, all of us on earth, all of us live a life That it is judged, and it has to be judged. And if there's sin in your life, it will be found out, and it will be judged. Again, as a hard, hard truth. A verse for you here in 2 Thessalonians. Paul talks about this. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. See, this is what happens when we don't hit the mark. This is what happens when we let sin remain in our life. The worst part about this is not the punishment. The worst part about this is being shut out from the presence of the Lord. That's that's the bad part. See, that's the part that, that broke Christ on the cross is that when Christ died on the cross for us, He took on all of our sins. And in the moment of taking on all of our sins, He was shut out from the presence of the Lord. Because a holy God is a just God. And a just God judges sin. And Jesus hung on the cross with all of your sin. And when Jesus experienced being shut out from the presence of the Lord... He took something that you now don't have to deal with. See, Jesus took all of your sin. You are now able to enter into the presence of God. But see, here's the thing. If we don't accept the reality of hell, then we will never appreciate the depth of God's goodness and grace. Is that not the truth? If we don't accept this, we'll never appreciate the goodness of God's grace. If we don't accept the reality of hell, it's such a hard reality to accept that we're sinners and that we sin. 
But because of what Jesus did for us, because of the goodness and the grace, then we, we let that go. So guess what? I was born. I'll give you a little personal information about Chris Ladd here. I'm 39 years old, and on June 5th, 1983, I was born into this world as a sinner. And on July 21st, uh, 1996, I bowed down on my knee, and I gave my life to Jesus. And in that moment, my sin died. And I, I, I left the reality of hell and entered into the reality of heaven because I had God's goodness and grace on my side. It, it was just a decision. It just took me a moment And my entire life, my entire eternity changed. See, we actually have a God that desperately wants us to not go to hell. We have a God that puts puts everything in in front of us so that we don't have to take that pathway. So I I have a story to to read to you. And this is where we get the title of the sermon. And it's called A A Voice from Hell. And this is a story by Jesus. So Jesus is telling a story to his disciples. And we're going to go through it quickly. And then there's just four things I want you guys to kind of understand about this story. And then we're going to wrap up with with an opportunity for you guys. But this is a story that Jesus is telling because he he wants his disciples to understand what it means to go to this place, what it means if you, if you remain a sinner and you, and you go to hell. He wants them to really grasp it. And again, he's not telling this story to unbelievers. He's telling this story to his disciples. And so here, here's the story from Jesus. So in verse 19, Luke chapter 16, Jesus says, There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. Now this man was super rich. Because purple was reserved for only royalty. It was a very hard color to get in the day. And then fine linen, a piece of linen, a piece of fine linen would would be the equivalent of what a a person would spend on food for an entire year. So this man is crazy rich. And at his gate uh, laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. So now you have two people. You've got the rich man and you've got Lazarus. I told you guys a couple weeks ago that, that as we talked about the difference between the rich and the poor, if you feel convicted for being rich, we have a bank account where you can put all of your money into. And, and when you get to the end of this story, you may decide you want to do that. And we, we're okay with that. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So anyway, this is, this is at the rich man's gate. You have him and you've got Lazarus, this poor, this poor person. It's not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. It's a different Lazarus. So let's go on to the next verse here, continuing the story. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked the, the Lazarus' sores. So what would happen is that rich people would often wash their hands and kind of dry them and, with, with bread. It would kind of just get the dirt off. And the crumbs from the bread, they would throw out to the dogs. And so this is what he's talking about here. This man, Lazarus, would take even the crumbs from dirty hands. So in verse 22, the time came when the beggar, he died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now Abraham was Father Abraham. So Jesus is painting this picture that Abraham's in heaven. Lazarus, who's laid on the ground with sores and been been, uh, competing with dogs for food, he dies and he's carried up to heaven. And then in the next verse... The rich man, he also dies, but he was buried, and he was buried in Hades. So Jesus is is painting this picture of Lazarus in heaven, the rich man in Hades. And when he was in Hades, he was in torment. He looked up, and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side, and he calls out to him, and he says, So he called to them, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony because of this fire. And then verse 25. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And so the man continues on in the next verse. It says, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. So that between heaven and hell, between God and the rich man, a great chasm is set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Jesus is saying we are permanently divided. There's nothing that can cross over here in this. And then in verse 27, 
He goes on to say, and he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. So Lazarus is now pleading for his family because he knows that they're headed in the same place. And then in verse 29, Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. So he's basically saying, Hey, they've got the same opportunity as everybody else. They have the same Bible, they have the Bible, they have the same opportunity as everyone else. They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. And then the guy says, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Now I think that this is a little bit of foreshadowing here, because if we go on to the next verse in verse 30, the man says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if Someone rises from the dead. It's kind of like saying, even if Jesus rises from the dead and is resurrected, there are a bunch of people out there that still will not be convinced of his love for them. So there's a lot of truth in here. So there's four quick truths for you here. The first one is that the rich man was fully conscious and aware. He knew where he was. He felt the fire. He felt the pain. He felt the hot. He was fully conscious and aware of it. The second truth was that the rich man's eternity was irrevocably fixed, meaning there was no crossover back and forth. I can earn my way out of hell. I can lose my way out of heaven. There was none of that happening. The third thing was that the rich man knew that his suffering was just. He complained about his suffering, but he never complained about where he was because he knew that he probably deserved to be there. He had the same opportunity as everyone else. And he's not complaining about being in hell. He's complaining about the suffering that he's experiencing there. And the last one is that the rich man begged and pleaded for someone to help his brothers to know Jesus. See, so he begged and pleaded for his family because he knew that they were going to repeat the same thing that he was. See, last week we talked about this concept, and I'll bring it up again this week. It, it's still not fair that bad things happen to good people. And it's also not fair that good people go to hell. And just like I said last week, I want to bring it up again this week. There's not a good person in this room. That's what we talked about. We're all born sinners. Jesus was the only good person that a bad thing happened to because he was perfect and he took on the sin of the world. Jesus is the only person that experienced the complete absence of the presence of God because he took on your sin. He's the only good person that went through this. So when we say these things, we're thinking about ourselves. We're trying to say, but I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Why would God let a bad thing happen to me? Like I said last week, you're not a good person. This is a message full of amazing encouragement. You're not a good person. You have sin in your life. Hell's a real place that you can go to. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to give you all the bad stuff, and then next week will be a lot uh, more fun and lighter, but I want you guys to know this stuff. But see, God doesn't want to leave you just with that. He, he wants to give you some hope. I'll read a verse for you in, in Romans here where that hope comes in. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So there it is. And let me put this to you really, really simply. You have a question, or you have a, you have a choice to make here. Would you rather be a good person, or would you rather be a redeemed person? See, I think I would rather be a redeemed person, because good people can go to hell, because actually there are no good people. But a redeemed person, that, that's a place that you will never visit or never have to go to. See, in 2 Peter 3.9 it, it says this about this. The Lord is not slow to keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, because he is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants every single person to have an opportunity to repent and to choose him and, and to take on the grace that God has for you, to take on the goodness that God has for you. See, the truth is that a loving God does not send people to hell. That's the answer to the question that we open with. How can a good person be sent to hell? Why does God send good people to hell? A loving God doesn't send good people to hell. A loving God sent His Son to redeem us and save us from hell. See, that's the truth for you. 
So I want to walk you through this one more time because I want to make sure it's so simple. And then I'm going to leave you with a question and then, then the band's going to come out for us. Okay? The, the, this is, it's so important that you get this whether you know Jesus or don't know Jesus. There is no condemnation in this room. No condemnation for you. You know what condemnation is? You're being condemned. Okay? And that, that's not what Jesus does. Jesus isn't here to condemn. Jesus will convict you. See, convicts you brings you to a good place and a healthy place. It brings you to Christ. Condemnation makes you feel guilty and shameful and worthless. And so you want to go away from Christ. So if you're sitting in your chair right now and you're feeling like, I want to get out of here. I don't have anything to do with this. I don't have anything to do with this Jesus thing. This hell thing is super scary. I can't believe that pastor guy called me a sinner. He doesn't know how good or bad I am. Man, I'm ready to blow this joint. And I'm going to get on Facebook and tell everybody this place is horrible. And I'm going to give it one star on Google reviews. And this thing is going to just burn to the ground. If you're feeling that way, I just want you to know that I understand and, and it's okay, but don't stay that way because that's not a feeling from God. That's not a feeling from Jesus. That's not a feeling from a loving Heavenly Father who sent His Son to die for you. That, that's what Satan wants you to think because he doesn't want you to bump up against the reality of the fact that you have a God that has made it so easy for you and so simple for you to be redeemed. So easy. I mean, God loves you so, so incredibly much. So the conviction that I hope you feel is I hope in this room you feel like the presence of God is chasing after you desperately. Like He just wants you. He wants you to come to Him. And remember, Jesus and the holiness of God set the mark, okay? And it's absolutely unobtainable. Therefore, we're all sinners. And because sin is evil, God has to judge it because He's holy. And because He's holy, He also has to be just. Therefore, we all have to be judged by God. But God gave us the easiest way out because He sent His Son to redeem us. And so again, you're left with the question, would you rather be a good person or would you rather be redeemed? Would you rather say, you know what, I'm just going to live my best life and try and be as good as I can? Or would you rather just raise your hands and say, you know what, God, take it from me. Just redeem me. Just, just redeem me. Forgive me my sins. Take all this away from me. I want to just let all of this go. See, my, my hope and prayer for you is, is, is this. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then the band is going to sing but I'm going to, I'm going to lead you in a prayer and there's two people that this prayer is going to go to this prayer is going to go to the person that doesn't know Jesus at all you're not a Christ follower, you're not a Christian you don't know much about the Bible you don't know much about any of this stuff but you're here and, and, and the, the first part of this prayer is for you. It's to give you an opportunity to do what I did on July 21st, 1996, on a Monday night at 8 o'clock at night. I, I knelt down on one knee. You don't have to do, you know, we don't have to kneel on, on knees, but that's just what, what we did. I knelt down on one knee and I prayed a simple prayer and I went from, from good to redeemed. I went from a sinner to having no blemish or no sin on me ever. That's the thing is ever, 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 ever. I never have to worry about it because I'm redeemed forever. Nothing can take that away from me. And then the second prayer is for those of you that you have given your life to Jesus. You are a Christ follower, but, but you've been convinced over the time that you're no longer redeemed. You've let life just kind of take hold of you. You've let life just consume you. you just, you're feeling down about yourself. You're feeling bad. Feeling like maybe you're not good enough or maybe you missed the mark. The, the prayer for you is that, that you remember that you are redeemed. So let's let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father.